Morning folks, um, I'm David McCracken um, from Scotland's Rural College. Uh, I head up uh, what we call a Helen Mountain Research Centre. So I think Sheena said I was going to talk to you about agriculture today. I'm only going to talk to you about hill farming today, because agriculture covers a wide range of things from arable crops through to dairying. I'm sure we'll hear about dairying sort of later on today. Uh, but <coughs> hill farming, um, if you actually look at Scotland um, as a whole, hover above it and look at it, then Scotland, 40% of Scotland is mountainous, if you think of it in terms of pointy bits. But actually, 70% of Scotland is of sort of hill and mountain character, because the further north and west you go, then the more you get mountain vegetation occurring right down at actually sea level. Now that mountain type vegetation is quite um, unproductive from a livestock sort of grazing perspective. So a lot of what our work um, is, our, our centre is based to the north of Loch Lomond, within Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park, between Cree and Larrick and Tyndrum, if any of you know that sort of area at all. So a lot of our work is aimed at how trying to actually help um, um, do research but also do knowledge exchange to help farmers and crofters understand how they can actually improve the productivity and the performance, the health and the welfare of their sort of livestock um, on, on their farms. So all I'm going to do today, I'm just going to talk to you one slide, um, but just trying to give you an idea of sort of the range of skills that um, our farm staff and our research staff have to try and sort of address those sort of issues. Do we have a pointer on this? Yes. So, so um, um, most health farmers, most crofters, they're primarily focused on livestock, so livestock like sheep, livestock like cattle. Um, and so a lot of what we need to know collectively, not everybody, but at least have a good set of skills, is knowing about an basic animal biology, and animal nutrition, what type of um, um, feedstuffs does um, those uh, sheep and cattle actually need in order to sort of be, be um, um, in good health and, and good welfare and to actually be productive to produce cows, to produce calves, to produce lambs, to go through the sort of the an annual cycle. Um, but also, <coughs> those um, livestock don't just exist in isolation, they've got to eat something. So again, a lot of what we're also doing is looking at the sort of the soils where we're actually our, our animals are grazing, um, the grassland management uh, uh, for our actual livestock itself, trying to make sure that we're managing the actual that environment just as well, um, and ensuring that the, so that the grass can actually grow as good as it can, not just to actually um, have the animals eating that grass um, during most of the most of the sort of the spring, summer, and autumn, but also so as we can produce silage for our um, cattle during during the winter. And that's you know it sounds easy easy in principle, but it's not that easy in practice when you've got uh, a relatively small amount of good quality grass. We've got 70 hectares of good quality grass and over 1,500 hectares of sort of moorland vegetation, upland <coughs> sort of vegetation. <coughs> but we're trying to actually marry those together, understand what the animals need, understand what the environment is actually producing, providing for them, and actually manage the environment to benefit the actual animals themselves. But like Chris has also said, <coughs> farmers don't, farming and farmers and their livestock don't exist in, in, in isolation <coughs> from the environment. So when you go into uh, your, uh, the hills and uplands of, of Scotland, we have lots of habitats and species, wildlife that are actually of nature conservation value. So also a lot of what we are doing is looking at the actual the ecology um, of the farms and trying to actually ensure that the type of management practices that we're advising the farmers to do are either um, sustainable into the sort of future or even actually actively managing the environment so that it benefits the actual wildlife um, and the habitats that are actually out there. Uh, and there are actually um, schemes available from Scottish Government and others that actually reward farmers for actually managing and the, uh, uh, the land on their farm to benefit the sort of ecology, to, to benefit the sort of wildlife. And also, I mean, just looking at what the sheep needs or the cattle needs or the soil needs or the grass needs is all very well, but we are actually looking at things in a, in a, in a row. We look at um, um, uh, our farms as a systems type approach and work out if we actually do this to actually improve the, the, uh, the uh, performance of the sheep, for example, what are the trade-offs? What are the benefits elsewhere on the farm? But also, what might be some disbenefits elsewhere on the farm? We try to sort of work out what those trade-offs are and whether they're acceptable to us and whether they might be acceptable to farmers. So, a lot of the sort of systems-type approach, we're actually looking at the sort of the economics of the different choices, the different farm management practices, the cost of doing something, but the benefit of actually farmers doing that itself. And then. Um, 
a, a lot of what we're doing is this, the, the sort of soil management, the, the grassland management, uh, the genetics of our, of, of our sheep and our, our, our cattle. They are more sort of traditional, basic sort of skills that are still very, very important in that sort of rural environment. But we're also actually highlighting um, in recent years how using technology um, 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 can really sort of benefit farmers in the sort of hills and uplands um, of Scotland and elsewhere. So I don't know how many of you have heard of the phrase precision agriculture, but when people talk about precision agriculture, they're largely in their heads. They've got somebody sitting on a tractor with little sort of uh, cameras recognising the weeds in the crop that they're driving through and choosing which spray to actually um, kill those weeds for. But we are doing a lot of focus on what we call precision livestock farming. We think using technology is just as important or even more important in these extensive grazing systems across Scotland to actually help um, reduce um, labour costs, allow um, the, the, the farmers to actually concentrate their efforts much more on actually looking at their, their livestock or their grassland or their soils uh, in a lot more detail, free up their time to do be, be stock person, stock people um, again. So we're looking at where our skills involve a lot of sort of um, technology, so uh, you can't necessarily see it very well there, but that's a conveyor, does exactly what it says in the, the tin, the animal steps onto it, there's two bands that basically just lift it off its feet and just dry, move it slowly along um, on, on, uh, on the backwards as well. And that, if any, who's worked with sheep in here? Anybody work with sheep in here? A few of you. It's Blooming hard, I'm going to say something else, it's blooming hard work, you know, they struggle, whereas if you put them on that sort of conveyor, this is, you can't necessarily see, that's upside down, quite happy, quite comfortable on that conveyor, that's a vet who would otherwise be down like this, trying to actually hold a sheep and show the farmers the feet of the animal and how they can actually um, um, can tr trim the feet properly, cut the toenails properly. That animal is comfortably there. The feet are all sticking up, the vet's stepping back, and you can't see it here, we've got 50 farmers standing there, seeing quite well what is actually happening, and he can actually explain to them what's actually going on. The technology here, this is a, a, a little sort of crate, the animal walks into, it's automatically weighed, um, and on the basis of the, the, the computer that we program, we decide what we want, which animals we want split off. This machine, on its own volition, each animal comes in, the machine decides, to send those animals one of five ways, depending on how we've actually programmed that. We can put 500 animals per hour through that bit of kit and have them split into five different groups, groups that we can then say, these groups, the 30 animals in this group, are all underweight, for example. How do we then feed them better to actually, to do, feed them differently than the rest, to actually improve their, their sort of health and their performance? And everybody will recognise a drone, I'm sure, so there's a lot of work we're doing with drones, looking at how drones can be used to actually assess sort of um, weed um, occurrence in some of our inby fields or measure the extent of bracken, which is a weed that covers the, it's really covering the, uh, the hills um, of Scotland and, and, and large parts of the UK. So lots of sort of um, engineering skills, technology sort of skills. Um, but like um, Chris was saying, a lot of what we're doing is dealing with communication. Uh, our farm staff, my research staff, they have to have good communication skills. It's no good us knowing what farmers could be doing to help improve their lot if we can't actually communicate to that to them. And that means communicating it not just by standing up and telling them about it, but by standing up and converting biological, <coughs> and ecology, engineering and technology language into a language that farmers can actually appreciate and understand. And so a lot of what we are doing is actually trying to understand each other's language. I'm an ecologist, so I sit over sort of here. But I've started to get a bit more of an understanding about some of the engineering and the technology side of things. Know a bit about the biological sciences side of things. So um, even though I've been 30 years in the business, I'm learning myself all the time. My staff are learning themselves all the time. And the final thing to say, just with regard to this communication, with, with regard to the sort of uh, knowledge transfer work that we're doing, um, Goodness, I took over the site four years ago. I think before I took over um, my team, they were doing events, maybe one, one or two events a year at the most. We're now doing at least one event per week, if not more. Their communication skills have come on leaps and bounds. I can stand here and tell you about everything we are doing, but if I wanted to talk about, the, or wanted you to understand the importance of the genetic work that we are doing and how it's improving the sheep, 
I'm not the best person to talk to, to tell you about that. My colleague Anne um, and Nicola, they're the ones that would be able to explain that better to you. John would be able to understand this, like the use of drones, etc., etc. They've come on leaps and bounds. So communication skills are vital in any industry, but certainly if you're trying to encourage um, either um, explain to young people what type of rural careers there are out there or explain to any sort of farmer or land manager how they can try and do things differently <coughs> then actually you need to have good communication skills to do that. Tracy may or may not agree, farmers are thrawn, they don't like change, they, th they generally think that they know how to do things and do things in the best way possible so you have to then find a way to actually convince them that to look at sort of other things. The final thing just to say is there's a big focus on DYW developing the young workforce um, here today. And we're also, we're fortunate, we sit, as I say, just north of Loch Lomond, we sit on the boundary of um, four uh, developing young workforce areas, um, Perth and Kinross, Forth, uh, Argyll and the Islands and Loch Aber. Um, and we're co working with colleagues in um, um, Perth and Kinross, looking to get a date next May, whereby we want to actually have a day where um, we can facilitate um, 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 a minibus full of uh, um, pupils from at least 12 schools drawn from across that whole area to come to our farm, not just to hear what we are doing and particularly hear about the high tech side of things that we are actually involved <coughs> in. But once we've got a date, I'll be speaking to colleagues in Forestry Commission, in the National Park, in Lantra, trying to actually see who else might be available to come along and actually have a, have a, a set of stations that we can actually rotate those pupils around all, and their teachers around those 12 different stations explaining the broad range of sort of rural careers that are actually out there, how technology is a big part of that and the type of skills that's actually needed for that. <coughs> that's all I'm going to say just before she puts up the end signal. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.